Hey everybody and welcome back to Dude's Brunch, your late night morning talk show. I'm your host Taylor Olmstead, and here with me this week, as every week, to talk about what he ate and what he looked at online, it's Tyler Reed. Hey Tyler, how's it going buddy? Eh. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you at least have a good brunch today? I did. Went to Sleepy Beat today. Uh, mix it up, I know. Usually it's coffee and for him. I know. But, uh... I went ahead and we, we, Catherine and I got lunch yesterday. I got Chipotle, and so I was like, great, you can get brunch tomorrow. <laughs> Which is not a fair trade at all. I love you. <laughs> but I had the same sandwich I always have, which is the Queen City Bee, which is a get a sandwich with egg and apple and blah, blah, blah. And it's on a delicious ciabatta bun. It's very delicious. Real talk. I'm going to be back in the Cincinnati area for the holidays. And I want to go with you to Sleepy Bee and get this mystical get a sandwich one morning. Can we do that? Right. Yes, absolutely. Awesome. Sean Evans is here. Hey, Sean. What did you Hi. have for brunch today? Um, today I had... Oh, man, what did I have? Oh, banana bread, because we talked about it last week, and so I went out and made it. I overbaked it. It wasn't as underbaked as I like to have it, but and I had that in black coffee. So good, good breakfast. Were you also hammered when you made it? or No, no, no. I'm not. <laughs> That's or why was. it wasn't undercooked. Wasn't. I'm a real boy now with a real job. Mm-hmm. Shame. Happens to the best of us. Well, for brunch this morning, I had a bowl of cereal, which was really unremarkable. But then, for early lunch slash brunch follow-up... I know this is going to make Sean really mad. Um, I went to Tom and Chi... And had a delicious grilled cheese sandwich. I just felt like I should say that to represent a good Cincinnati company that makes delicious food. Way to go. They came all the way down to Georgia, <laughs> Alabama. They, they got those things everywhere, man. Yeah, seriously. Oh, yeah? After they went on Shark Take, they have expanded out to, like, all over the country. Nice. Did you just have a regular uh, grilled cheese, or did you just do one of those wacky and wild? So I had never had the original Tom and Chi which is a grilled cheese with garlic and diced tomato on it. And so I got that, and it was pretty good. Mm. Usually I get the flying pig, which is the one with bacon and turkey on it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. For, the, for, the, for the record, and Emily will vouch for this, um, Tom and Chi is stupid and dumb. If you really want the, the grand grilled cheese experience in Akron or Cleveland, or I think there's a Melt in Cincinnati now, or Columbus, go to Melt. That's where the real grilled cheese is at. See, and not just this crappy, like, I agree fast, with casual you. stuff. I realize this is going to be off-brand for me, but I agree with you. I actually like Melt, even though it's from Cleveland. And I do think it's a superior oh. grilled cheese. Oh. Excuse me? I know, right? I, I, I like Melt, even though it's from Cleveland. Yeah, that must be nice to be able to say that. Melt I mean, is they do more have like an award-winning basketball team, right? <laughs> valid. Melt is more like dinner grilled cheese, though, and Tom and Chi feels more like lunch grilled cheese. Because those Melt sandwiches are freaking huge, and like Man, I can almost never eat a whole one. You are the king at making distinctions between like really arguably minuscule differences. Damn right. Uh, it's a lunch grilled cheese versus a dinner grilled cheese. That's, a, that's, a, that's the stupidest thing ever. But we won't go into that because we already killed a whole show talking about how Sean just doesn't see the whole point of, you know, using positive, you know, the scientific method to distinguish between meals. But hey, whatever. That, that's fine. That's right. We're over it now. I just I was realized... hoping to get Emily back in good graces by making that comment, but I can see that you had to did take me down that route. So it's over now. It's fine. I... That's really what this is all about is to just make Emily dislike you more and more until she comes back on the show and you two fight. I'm not going to fight Emily. The brunch episode was actually Sean's first think piece. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, all right, so brunch. It's what stupid, is? but also <laughs> it's about the patriarchy. <laughs> Tyler, have you noticed that um, Taylor has an NPR voice? I noticed it when he changed over from the casual speaking to doing the recording that he, he kind of drops a little bit in tone. I appreciate it. I appreciate your dedication to this podcast, Taylor. That's what I'm trying to say. Thank you, Sean. There it is. Did you hear it? That's his, that's his like NPR voice right there. You know, I do the NPR voice on purpose because I just it like in my brain, I have to shift from talking to you guys and talking to the audience. I don't know why, but there's like this part of me 
that just as soon as I hit the record button and the little red light starts blinking, my brain yeah. goes into a different mode. I mean, for everybody who doesn't listen to the podcast, Taylor actually sounds like this in real life. That's he right. A, he has quite a squeak little voice, but that's okay. We love him all the same. So let's get into some follow-up. <laughs> this week in follow-up, a man literally set himself on fire. I don't know if you guys saw this article. It's actually very sad, and I don't mean to make a joke out of it. But an Akron man set himself on fire after being angry at the results of the presidential election. I just wanted to bring this up to remind everybody that it's all going to be okay. Memes still exist, and the internet is still a lovely place, and you don't need to go set yourself on fire outside of a coffee shop. Oh, I don't think... Uh, memes were the... <laughs> no, but I feel like it's important to have memes to remind you that this is all absurd anyway, and we're all going to go into the void. Well, as as we've discovered, uh, Donald Trump was the clear the clear choice for improving our meme economy. So, I, you know, not even starting his presidency yet, Donald Trump has called Hamilton overrated. So we already know that the meme economy is already doing just fine. It's all going to be okay, kids. Don't set yourself on fire. Just post dank memes. We're going to make it through this presidency just like we made it through all the other ones. By making really commercial pop punk music and making up memes. I believe he was also a Marine. I believe is what the article was saying. He was he, he was wearing a Marine uniform. He was wearing a Marine uniform. Gotcha. Yeah. But he was not actually a Marine. Yeah. Yeah, there's no real like indication of what his motivations were. I just feel like this week for me especially, has been a lot of, like, everybody's really upset, and I feel like we just need to remind each other that it's not all that bad. So in other follow-up news, Apple Surprise released a new product this week, and we're all taking a look at it here. Apple's new book, Designed by Apple in California, chronicling 20 years of Apple design led by director of design Johnny Ive. This book comes in two sizes and starts at 200 U.S. dollars. I've also seen images on the internet that show that this book comes with a pamphlet that includes all of the captions to the images. So it's a book with another book that has all of the text that's supposed to be in the book. Now that's funny. Because heaven heaven forbid any text disgrace the photographs of Johnny Ive's perfect little book. I mean, I I heard about this book, but I didn't realize that there was a sub-book for the book. Yeah, it's like a little leaflet that just acts as a companion to it and comes in the box. I mean, that's kind of like what an index, what a forward and afterward. I feel like that's what those are for. Right. I don't know. How Do we know how much uh, information is inside of that? Because, um, I mean, if it's... Each caption is like a sentence or two, and it's laid out in four columns per page, and I think it's like ten-ish pages long. Every image in the book has a caption of some sort, and it's a oh. like a 300-page book. Or no, sorry, it's a 450-page book. I mean, this just seems like the most self-centered thing that Apple could possibly do, especially after what we talked about last week with this whole dongle issue with the new MacBooks and how they had to cut the prices on the dongles because people were complaining that they were too expensive. And so then they turn around a week later and release a $200 photo book. I mean, that to me still doesn't seem like the issue. I mean, that's fine. They're allowed to release an art book. Art books are allowed to be expensive because, I mean, the pictures, and at least just from the few I've seen of these 400 photos, I mean, that... Probably took a lot of time, a lot of effort getting those very pristine photos together. I mean, I don't know how like how many they just had on hand. They probably reshot everything just because. Uh, I mean, I mean, yeah, it's basically a coffee table book. I mean, which means you'll get flipped through about once or twice a month, if that. You know, people will take a look at it. It'll it'll be there as a reference. It's a guide. I mean, uh, some of the stuff you probably can't find anymore, but especially like the the really really old like. Apple computers, the multicolored ones on the first part of this page here. I mean, probably finding images of those in like a really good high quality version are probably hard to find, especially in, in pristine condition. So, I mean, yeah, it's excessive. So are most product books, most art books. Now, the issue of having a sub book uh, feels like the most appropriate thing of, of the new Apple, which is we're going to be really elegant and clean, but we're also like... We're going to fuck it up somehow. Yeah. 
the uh, the film that accompanied the launch of this book is kind of like that too. It's like for two minutes they don't even show the book; they just show the interior of like the Apple design offices, which is really cool. And Johnny Ive is narrating and talking about the process of design and all this stuff. And then all of a sudden it starts showing him leafing through the book and he's like, this book was crafted lovingly from photos of the last 20 years. And you're like, oh, why'd you have to go here? Why did this book need a three and a half minute announcement video? Like all of this just seems so excessive. But it's here. And so there's that. Well, I would say that this is a this is a very much an enthusiast piece. I would say, I would say it's definitely not for the average customer. If they wanted to be for the average customer, they probably would have had half the things and then half the price. Uh, but Apple really doesn't like to you know shy away from making a shot lots of cash that they were going to do it right. I mean, maybe it's just an issue of we're all relatively creative, but I mean. Not really, like in the in like the actual like creative field. I mean, I I'm technically not either, but I feel like I have probably have a much more greater appreciation for it. Like, there's a really good image here that's just like an iPod, like a like an iPhone three that's like really like dinged up, like really like really like been used. And I'm like, that's I mean, that's kind of interesting. There's a lot of I love that image. I definitely think it has value. I mean, I, I mean, I guess maybe I'm just not seeing the the ridiculousness of it that you guys are. Sean, any thoughts before we move on? As an Apple consumer, I wish that they would spend as much time as they did on a art book as they would on actually making a product that people want to buy again. Yeah, I, I just think that that. I mean, that's pretty much I mean, it's the name I on mean, the head. Don't don't get me wrong. Like, I know this is like a big thing for like tech companies in California that they have to like diversify their incomes to make their IPOs seem legitimate. Which you know, not just their IPOs, but their stock in general, and make it seem with their shareholders like they're actually developing something that's worthwhile. But this doesn't feel like that at all. This feels like the opposite right. of that. Right. And I mean, like, Apple at least has, like, actual product and value that's worth giving money to instead of just speculating whatever they might be worth, which is a whole other topic for this show. But this is just dumb. This just, just goes to show that, like, I mean, I, I love this product. I, I want to keep going with this product, but I'm losing interest really quickly. As, yeah, I don't... as Beck once said, Wow! I mean, you're right that this probably would have been a really good thing to have, like, sort of, like, in the Jobs era, like, like sort of, like, towards the end of his, his era, because that's when I feel like it was, they were probably at their strongest, like, when they were, I feel like they were really pushing forward, really doing interesting things. At this point, it's just kind of, like, you're only invested in Apple for, like, a legacy. Well, you, you, you got us roped in, you know, I've had the same, the same laptop since 2009, that's, you know, still in the jobs era so haven't bought a new one since that's that's kind of how this that's kind of how this feels like there was a thing that kept coming up on my google this week on my google news that like m shadows from Avenged sevenfold was really mad that warner brothers wanted to do a greatest hits of Avenged sevenfold and it was kind of like why we still have lots of music to make why would we do a greatest hits this is what you think we're like over or something like that and it kind of feels like apple just wants to go there like Apple already wants to do a greatest hits because they know that they're just they're just coasting now. They're just that's, it's over. See, that's an interesting argument because what I've been hearing is kind of similar to that but different. A lot of people are thinking that this is Johnny Ives' last hurrah and this is the sign that he's going to leave Apple and all of Apple's design is going to move in mm. a different direction. Right. That's a that's a good point. You're about to leave a technology company, so you make something that's like so old. Yeah, no, that's that makes perfect sense. Like it's it's so funny because it's like if you were I don't know like an aerospace engineer, and then you decided that you wanted to make a rock. Here's a rock to show off all of my hard work. NASA rock. That is kind of what this feels like. It's like this thanks, Johnny, stupid. for the great gesture showing us how hard you've worked over all these years. And like, Unless this is an April Fool's joke. Maybe they put the decimal point in the wrong place. And Sean's Sean's benevolent argument is decimal point was in the wrong place. Mistakes happen. Christmas gift. That also. I don't don't you have that person in your life that you just don't know what to get for them. You know their entire space is white. They have like five things in their entire house, and four of those are computers. And no. Then, and then a drawer full of dongles to plug into those computers that's hidden that's secretly under dongles. a table. This is like the most sadistic gag gift ever. Like, right now in Syria, 
children are dying, people are dying in the streets, and you decided to get somebody a three hundred dollar book with Apple products in it. Yeah, I mean that's totally like first world problems and blah blah blah, whatever else. But like we did it, we did it. I, I think this is it. I think that for me, in my mind, next to diet soda, which is something you consume that is literally nothing, I'm gonna go ahead and put this book up there. That's a high standard. That's a high standard. As like the peak of pointless consumerism? Mm, no, I think we still have a long way to go to get to that peak. But but right now, I'm, I'm going to go with, uh, this will make it base camp level. Okay, so this week, the first topic that I want to talk about was uh, Vice News Tonight. They have this little section called Patrick Carney's High Standard Music Corner, (laughs) which is probably one of the better segments on this entire news program, even though I probably watch it every single day, just to see what's going on in terms of what Vice News wants to show people. Um, Because the other night it was on when Sarah and I were watching it, and it was not the segment that I posted, but it's hilarious, like the commentary that he has to say. So a little bit of background about Patrick Carney. He's from Akron. Um, He is the drummer of the Black Keys. He is one of the two members, and for some reason, he's pretty much, I don't know, tell me if you disagree or think you might have a different view of this, that Patrick Carney is the kind of go-to hater of pop music. Like, he always, like, didn't he get in a a fight with Justin Bieber on Twitter about something? Yes, he he, did. A very public Twitter feud. Yeah, which is pretty much, like, saying that you put, like, sock and boppers on and then, like, beat each other up in the backyard but like but still like did you guys watch the segment yes it was awesome (laughs) so if you haven't watched this clip you should pause the podcast right now scroll down into the show notes and watch it because it's hilarious (laughs) and this is kind of like the this is okay i say this is the first one of the series um and the the more that i've watched it everyone that comes up the more critical he kind of gets, like the more you kind of start to figure out Patrick Carney's music taste. And when they go to kind of play the song, he already has like, he can tell. Um, And he makes more exaggerated comments sometimes about different artists. So I wish there was more videos that we could, we could show us. So we have a better understanding of, um, of what's going on. But as consumers of music review, what do you guys think about this format? Compared to other ones. I like this because the blind listen is kind of cool. Like they just put a pair of headphones on him and he doesn't know what the song is because he mentions a couple of times, like his preconceptions about the artist, like the time that he said, Nora Jones music all sounds like the theme song from Frasier. (laughs) Like he's a very opinionated guy. And I think a lot of music fans are. And so to just do a blind listen test, I think is really, really useful. Well, listening to the theme song of Frasier. (laughs) Oh. Yeah? Now it makes sense. Anyway. (laughs) (laughs) Please repeat the question. So, because we always listen to different music reviews, on YouTube and whatnot, different music review personalities. What did you think about this particular format and, and Patrick Carney as a music reviewer? Do you like it? Do you hate it? Do you, what would you rate it? You're the best. You're the best. What should I review next? Hit that like, if you like, that's right. (laughs) Um, I think I actually kind of like the perspective of what, uh, other musicians listen to, because I would imagine that, when you're sort of like in the in the scene you know like if you're within like your own like sort of like uh area of expertise so like for example the black keys are are a very defining artist in a very specific like style of music um so it's interesting to find like to kind of like listen to like where like what they like and like where that kind of stuff kind of comes from and i think the first moment that i kind of realized that like um, I was like really into that sort of idea of like really trying to figure out what other musicians are like inspired by and liked or into was uh was Paramore. They specifically they were like the Get Up Kids and um like other sort of like uh 
like MXPX and like bands like bef- like way before like probably when they were kids. So um, that I feel like that's really helpful because as someone growing up, I was like, oh, I like this band, but I want to listen to more things like this band. And it's like you don't want to necessarily always just go straight across the line of like everything that came out like that year. Like I feel like it's good to have that depth to know like where people came from to get like appreciation for it. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of like why I find this sort of uh, content interesting specifically to see like what they think about what other people are making and sort of like what they're influenced by. So I think, I think that's a really good format. I mean, listen, I, I like non musicians or non like, you know, like people not like in bands doing reviews, but I think um, this sort of perspective thing is really helpful. Mm -hmm. I like that the interviews are short. Like I like that it's almost sketch. It's almost like a sketch comedy bit mm-hmm. or something. Like it's almost just go and they kind of just play it and see where it goes. Um, because sometimes when I listen to oh man, what's his name? Music's busiest internet nerd, Anthony Anthony Fantano. Fantano. Yeah, when I listen to Anthony Fantano, I kind of don't want to watch his like ten and a half minute video about a whole album. I I kind of just want to get a reaction um, to kind of get through music because that's how i listen to music personally like you've got 10 seconds to sell me a guitar line if you don't make it past that 10 seconds you're done like i'm moving on um and i know that's that's kind of like that's a very slash and burn kind of technique for going through um music but i've actually found a lot of success in it i have a spotify playlist from two months ago that's pretty deep right now with songs that I really like and that I can go back to and listen to entire albums of Mm -hmm. um, versus just, you know, I I feel like I'd rather just do that than have Anthony, which he's good in giving opinions, but I I feel like he kind of spoils an album for me sometimes because I feel like I need to listen to it all once he gives me the kind of rundown. Um, But if you can't make a track that interests me immediately, there's too much going on right now in terms of music, like, and which is fantastic, but you got to make something that appeals to my ear. Right. Like, uh, I pretty much like slash and burn, like my Spotify discover list pretty consistently. I'm like, all right, like I got like five or six, like eight bands that I can just flip through real quick. And if it doesn't immediately interest me, I'm like, all right, let's keep on going. Mm -hmm. And most of the time it's like pretty low level, like, you know, not like, like I'm, I'm so far beyond like artists that have, you know, the the really like mainstay artists that we all kind of know and love. I've kind of like forced my Spotify to really like give me like deep cuts that like, oh, this is like a 2013 like jazz fusion electronic. <laughs> I'm like, great, thank you. Oh, this is the the sweet juice I need. <laughs> Taylor, what, what do you think about this? I feel like you haven't. How do you feel about the slash and burn kind of thing? So the slash and burn is interesting to me. Um, It's not exactly how I consume music right now, but I agree with it. So what I do is uh, Apple Music does a weekly playlist, kind of like Spotify's, and it comes out on Friday. And so usually on Friday, I'll listen through the whole playlist, just start to finish. And then if any of the songs stick with me after the first listen those are the ones that I save and then I just stop listening to all the other ones. That's commitment right there. Well, you I have to listen to the entire one, like the entire list. Yeah. It's only like an hour and a half long and I just run it in the background while I'm at work. I don't like sit down and listen to it. It's always, no, like, but I mean, while like, I'm even doing just, something else, even just playing that, like I, I can't, I can't do that. Well, because a lot of times the stuff that shows up in my recommended is, kind of hard to like just slash and burn on um in particular right now i'm getting a lot of like underground rap which is really hard to get a read on sometimes because the first 20 seconds may only be the beat and you don't get any of the person (laughs) or like you may get the person rapping but then you don't get to the hook and like i need songs with a good verse and a good hook to really get me and so that's a problem but with the rock stuff yeah i'm 
exactly like you, Sean. I'm like, if the riff's not good and the vocal's not good in the first line, I'm out. Because there's so much other rock music that I could be listening to, plus all the stuff that's in my library already. That, mm-hmm. like, if you're just some generic punk band that's on my playlist, bah. <laughs> So when they edit this particular section of uh, High Standard Music Corner, they usually add, like, a Patrick Carney anecdote. And in the one that we have, he talks about Hulk Hogan not touching uh, a fret on the on the um, fretboard. That's, like, one of the ones. So, like, last week, he also talked about how he met Bon Jovi at a party and because they played Bon Jovi's new song for him. And he was like, oh, yeah, I met Bon Jovi once. And the story was that Bon Jovi and Patrick Carney and Chris Christie were at this party. And I guess Chris Christie is this huge fan of Patrick Carney or of uh, Bon Jovi. And Bon Jovi wanted nothing to do with Chris Christie. So he came over and was like talking to Patrick Carney about the Black Keys and stuff like that, trying to like keep his back towards Chris Christie so he'd be ignored the whole time he was there. Do you guys like having that little anecdote in there, or do you think it's kind of like, eh, just stick with the music? Oh, I love that shit. <laughs> I mean, considering so, it's only two minutes. Yeah, they're nice and short, too, which helps. But kind of like Tyler, I love watching interviews with bands, and especially when they talk about ba- other bands that they like and like tell stories and stuff. Uh, I've talked about it on the podcast before, but Moby has an excellent memoir out right now called Porcelain. That's all about his life in the 90s and his kind of rise to fame in New York. And as he starts getting famous, there are all sorts of little tiny stories like that of him being around famous people. And I love that shit. And I also like because he's a DJ, you get he like posts a lot of music recommendations of like stuff he's playing in his DJ sets or like when he's in interviews, he name drops people a lot. And some of my favorite artists I found through like him and other musicians just name dropping in interviews and telling stories about them. Like I found big Frida because Matt and Kim mentioned listening to her on their way to the stage. And then they did a remix with her and I was like, all right, this is cool. Why not? Like I'm all about that kind of anecdotal serendipitous discovery. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that, Tyler? Another personal anecdotes. Yeah. You like them as a, as a part of the, this kind of section or would you like to have it just be like just stick to the music bro i mean if it's only two minutes long i mean uh i mean that's that seems fine to me i mean <laughs> it's not like it's like a fucking like 20 minute video you know um, um it's pretty tolerable i mean um and i think he's definitely a person that i would like to hear more stories, more opinions about, especially considering uh, he's apparently very critical of music. So <laughs> he's very critical of everything. Oh yeah, sure. He's kind of a deep egg. He's a hater. And I guess maybe that that's sort of uh, hopefully over time will sort of like lighten up the video a little bit because I'm sure there's times where he's gonna be like, oh, this is garbage. This is garbage. Hate this. Hate that. But oh, there's like, stuff that he, personally there's stuff that he likes. Well, right. But I mean, like, it kind of like gives you a, a break from like a, a, a very the negative. It, it makes it a little less. It makes it more personable, less critical for a moment, and you're kind of like, ah, oh, okay, all right, all right, because you you don't want to be like, oh, this guy just hates everything. I don't want to watch this. All right, guys, it's time for Internet Garbage. And this week's Internet Garbage was submitted by listener Buddy. Thank you, Buddy. Uh, He sent us this video. It's called You Name It Challenge Dance Compilation. Hashtag You Name It Challenge. You Name It Challenge. Shirley Caesar Hold. We will link to it in the show notes so you don't have to search it. Well, this is the family-friendly meme of Thanksgiving, y'all. Okay, so the song is pretty catchy. This is, like, so simple, but... Alright, so let's, let's yes, yes, know this here. Do you guys know where this meme comes from? No. Tyler, do you know where no. this meme comes from? No. 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 So I didn't know where this meme came from until somebody at work told me about it the other day. 
basically there is this video of a woman who is speaking on stage at some sort of like church function or something. And she's talking about, um, watering the garden of your soul with like the living water of God or something. And so she extends this metaphor and talks about all of the things in the garden. So like beans and greens and tomatoes and all this stuff. And people have remixed this of course, and made it into a song. And so now we have this meme where it's just people dancing to this remixed version of her giving this speech. Potatoes, tomatoes, lamb, rams, hogs, dogs, chicken, turkeys, rabbits. You name it! God damn it! When I was sick, he healed me. When I was put out doors, he put a roof over my head. Have you got anything to praise him for tonight? I think uh, I think this this remix might replace uh, "Board This Way" as my <laughs> mid show jam. I kind of love it. I love how off the cuff it was as she was doing it. Like it's groovy. It's groovy, and it's about food. Everyone loves food. I think this was this was in garbage. This was made for the internet, man. Having just watched the remix and the original video, I mean, y- you two sound like you're both strongly in favor of you name it. Oh yeah. I am too. I am all in on this meme. If I could do justice to it, I would. I would. I would do a rendition of this one, but it's not. It wouldn't do it. No, I don't. That's the thing about this meme. I don't think anybody can like cover this meme. It's got to be her vocal. Mm-hmm. And I think this meme is really only going to make it through Thanksgiving weekend, and then she's going to go on Ellen, and it's going to be over. Just, okay. just everybody who knows knows about this meme on on like Thursday afternoon. Just stand somewhere in the back of your house and just yell, you name it, as loud as you can. I feel like every Chromecast in America is going to be playing this at some family gathering when the conversation gets too political. Mm. You're going to be like, hey, look at this funny YouTube video. (laughs) Beans, greens, tomatoes, lettuce. (laughs) Ha ha, isn't this great? Hashtag Trump's America, what? (laughs) I mean, I think it's okay that we can have a meme that lasts only about a week. I mean, that's usually how long they last, and then... They either die a nice, peaceful death, or they are eternally just, like, strung together and re and, and, and kept alive through shitty Facebook feeds. Oh, and this is built for Facebook, too. Mm-hmm. Because anybody can dance to this poorly and get put on Facebook. There's going to be so many, like, memes coming out on Thanksgiving Day of somebody just having all of these things and just the camera, like, vining, like, boom, 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 boom. And then someone at the end is going to be like, you name it. Hold on, Sean. Did you say Vine? Whatever. Instagram video, bro. Whatever. R.I.P. Vine. It's gone to be with Harambe. Ripperoni and the pepperoni. Vineroni. Yeah. I'm going to give this meme seven to ten days. But I think it's going to be a good seven to ten days. Perfect. It's going to. No, no, no. I'm going to give it till next Wednesday. Because it needs time to make it through at least till Friday, and then it has to play another two days of morning news show circuits like GMA and like CBS's morning show. It has to be on there. Well, that's like my thing is as we record this on Sunday the twentieth, I expect this woman to be on today in GMA on Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Okay, she's already got she already fielding interviews on here. Yeah, I mean, she's already kind of like a media celebrity-ish person. Like, she has one of these televangelist TV shows. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure she's jumping at the chance to go on national television with this. (laughs) And good for her. She made it. Mm Mm-hmm. All right, and now it's time to round the show out like we always do with a round of shameless plugs from the dudes. We're going to start... We're going to start with Tyler Reed. Tyler, what shameless plugs do you have? Tell to get a little trouble there, Taylor. <laughs> Sean kept pointing at himself, and I was like, does he want to go first? And then I remembered that Sean never gets to go first. Oh, well, I'm, I'm glad that you're committed to the bit, Taylor. Hey, everybody. You can find my work at tylerdreed.com. Please hire me, as always. Then, find me on social says TDR Design on Instagram and Twitter. Sean Evans, what do you have to plug this week? 
You can check me out on Twitter and Instagram at S E V A N S eight nine one zero sevens eight nine ten. That's my handle. Check me out. You won't, so don't worry about it. But if you do, I'll follow you back because you're awesome and I appreciate it. And thanks, buddy, for your awesome internet video. We should do more of those, so keep it up because that would be sweet. And you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter and the like at TC Olmstead. You can like the show on Facebook and Twitter as well. And, Tyler, will we have a new holiday sweater available by the time this episode publishes? That's a dangerous question to ask, Taylor. We'll see. A week from today? <laughs> Either way, rest assured, people. It's coming. The Dudes Brunch 2017 ugly holiday sweater is on its way to you, assuming you give us a little bit of money for it. So, And by us, we mean Redbubble, and by money, you mean thanks for wearing our sweater. <laughs> right. Yeah, you're mostly paying Redbubble, let's be real. Other than that, thanks everybody for listening, and we will see you next week with more brunch. Love how comfortable you look in your hoodie and headphones. I'm it's a good, pretty comfortable. It's a good look for you.